Am I correct that, uh, well, we saw uh, the former chief slowly at the top and then underneath him at the executive levels, uh, there are, there, there were uh, Deputy Ferguson who was in charge of community policing and then you in charge of the three eyes. That's correct. And then uh, going down uh, that line under you, um, we see um, intelligence. So we need to go further to the right. Mm -hmm. So now we see all three eyes. Uh, and then under intelligence directorate, uh, who was the superintendent in charge uh, when around January and early February? So yeah. I think it's important to note to the, the superintendent in charge at that point was Superintendent Patterson, and there had been um, a large uh, movement of superintendents and, and leaders within the directorate. So Superintendent Patterson was in charge, um, and he had two inspectors that reported to him, and that, that entire command team had just been placed in that area. Right. Uh, so let's talk about uh, that turnover. When did Superintendent Patterson assumed this role of the superintendent uh, of the lead of the intelligence unit. Uh, superintendent Patterson would have taken that position on on January 1st. Okay. And were you not relatively new as well uh, to this portfolio of the three eyes? That's correct. Um, towards the end of December, I was assigned into that area once uh, I was temp before that I was temporarily in the um, CAO or chief administrative officer role for a year due to a vacancy. And then in late December, I took over this portfolio and began to establish it with a new team. So you took over in December 2021. That's correct. And then um, in early January, uh, to 2022, Superintendent Patterson took the lead of the intelligence unit. That's correct. And he reported to you? Yes, he did. And under him, you said there are two uh, inspectors, right? And correct. you see on this chart, they are Inspector Cartwright and Inspector Bryden. Uh, when did they join the intelligence unit? Uh, so Inspector Cartwright was in the information services branch. Uh, in, right. Inspector Bryden was in the intelligence service branch and, and he, both of them started on January 1st as well. And how did those two branches uh, interact with each other, the intelligence and the information branches? So that was something that uh, we'd identified and that uh, Chief Slowly had identified as a, as a need for us moving ahead was how intelligence and information work together. So we had a large project underway at that time, which was around intelligence-led policing to look at how we most effectively gather, analyze, and share information through the organization. So um, they work together very effectively, but the, the goal of the ILP project, as we named it, was actually to identify how we can refine that sharing of information even more to make sure the information we're bringing into the organization is shared as broadly and effectively as it, as it could be. We had been involved in that project for probably over a year, and I, I can say that there were steps and there were um, efficiencies and improvements that had been found in terms of information sharing. Mm -hmm. Now, in the context of incident command, we've heard last week that uh, the command system is structured by way of three levels, strategic, operational, and tactical. Uh, when it comes to the work of the intelligence unit, uh, is that also the, the rough organization? Absolutely. So, um, in that structure, uh, you would be, I assume, the, at the top strategic level? That's correct. And uh, Inspector, sorry, Superintendent Patterson would be what? He would, he would be in the operational area. Um, and I would say Inspector Bryden would be moving from the operational to the tactical level. Right. And so, um, inferring from this tar chart, uh, did... Uh, Inspector Bryden report up to Superintendent Patterson then? Yes, he did. And they both report to you? That's correct. And, okay, so let's first talk about uh, that reporting process. Um, how often would you receive uh, an update or briefing from Superin Superintendent Patterson? 
specifically around the issue we're here to talk about or right. so, overall generally? So let's turn our mind back to around January, uh, February uh, of this year. Um, now, we've heard from other people that uh, Freedom Convoy related uh, events came into their radar uh, at around mid-January, say January 13th. So starting at around that time, uh, I'm just trying to understand the, the frequency of briefings and meetings and so on. So we, were, we had um, regularly scheduled bi-weekly meetings that we called uh, CTOM, Crime, Traffic and Order Management Meetings, that were run by the information branch and that were specifically designed to identify key areas uh, of risk and our response to it within the organization. So that, that level and frequency of briefing to the entire executive command uh, was on a bi-weekly basis as it, related to, um, as it related to overall issues. Specifically to the Freedom Convoy and, um, and the events around that, that was flagged, as you say, through a Hendon report around uh, January 13th. Uh, Superintendent Patterson and I began having discussions on it in and around the 20th. And the, reg the briefings were to me uh, in terms of the activities that they were taking, ensuring that the information was flowing, would have been on a regular basis. Um, I, I heard January the 20th. Did I hear it correctly? would have been in or in and around that week. I can't say which right. was the specific date through that week, but that's when it would have been flagged and raised in prominence that we would we did begin discussing it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we've spoken to the former chief slowly, and uh, I expect that he may give evidence that he became aware, well, he, uh, he was in receipt of the first Hendon report as of January the 13th, and he forwarded a copy of that report to you. What's your recollection? Uh, so my recollection is in, that I did not start receiving the Hendon reports until the 27th of January, and that was through discussion with Superintendent Patterson. So I, I don't I don't recall, and I don't have um, in, in searches. I don't believe I received that report. Now we've also spoken to uh, Inspector Bryden, and during his interview, uh, he informed us that he received a copy of the January 13th Hendon report from Superintendent Patterson. Um, have you, do, you, do you have any recollection at all that you received any Hendon report before the 27th? No, I didn't, no, I did, don't have any recollection. And we've searched to our database to identify when I did start receiving them, and it, it was on the 27th of January. Now, uh, as one of the deputies assisting the former chief, uh, and, you, uh, and you were tasked with uh, the intelligence uh, responsibility. Um, do you recall any discussions you had with the former chief about your specific assignment um, with respect to the Freedom Convoy events? Oh, absolutely. The, um, the, the chief slowly indicated when we began to discuss it. We also had morning command calls from 9 to 10 a.m. And during those calls, we would discuss issues that had occurred and emerging issues. The issue of the Freedom Convoy came on the, our radar in and around that week of the 20th. I'm not, uh, I can't specifically identify the day. And we had discussions and there was um, clear discussion around intelligence responsibility to be involved and uh, identify risks and threats and make sure that we were informing any sort of planning that was going to occur around our response. Um, I understand that Mr. Slowly, uh, the former chief, made it clear that he wanted all operations to be intelligence-led. Uh, is that your understanding too? Oh, absolutely. One of the um, one of the things that uh, Chief Slowly was very firm about was that intelligence, and, and I absolutely agree with it. Intelligence needs to inform the planning cycle, and it needs to be utilized to actually identify what our appropriate response is. And he um, assigned you the specific responsibility to ensure that appropriate intelligence were collected and disseminated to the planning team. That is correct. And um, so that would have been your duty as of around when. When do you recall that first discussion with Mr. Slowly took place? 
So again, I don't have a specific date, but it would have been in and around the, the week of the 20th. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure the specific date of it. Okay. Now, um, was a threat assessment eventually completed by the intelligence unit? Yes, it was. Um, I want to take you to um, a threat assessment that uh, the Commission has received. And uh, the document number is zero zero, uh, sorry, OPS four zeros four zero three nine. Now, looking at the first page, cover page, uh, this is a document uh, completed by Sergeant Chris Keyes, am I correct? That's correct. It is dated January 28th, but uh, the title is Freedom Convoy, Ottawa, January 29th, 2022. Is that right? That is correct. And uh, is the date, the title date January 29th because it was initially expected that the events would start on the 29th. That's correct, yes. But uh, this version uh, is was completed on the 28th, right? Correct, and it's version four, so there's been iterations of this as uh, more intelligence has been received, gathered, and analyzed. Right, uh, and I understand from uh, earlier witnesses' testimony that that week in particular was a very uh, fluid and dynamic week. Uh, lots of things happen. That is correct. Uh, in any event, we have reached now the, the 28th, and this is the, the threat assessment. I'd like to take you to page three. If we take a look at the second paragraph, can we enlarge yes, the, the screen a little bit? Thank you. Thank you. So you see that in the sep second, the second paragraph starts with the most likely police matter at this time will be the vast number of vehicles on the area roads. The convoy will be able to stop and effectively shut down movement if they desire. That's the understanding uh, as of the 28th, right? That is correct. And if we go down the page to the very bottom, the last sentence in bold says, these conditions create grounds for passionate emotions. And those conditions refer to uh, the sentiment uh, of the truckers. Sorry, I'm just reading the paragraph. Yes. Take your time. That is correct. Now, if we go to the next page, page four, and we go to the heading summation. So the, the writer concluded that there is a quickly growing financial fund that can pay for food, lodging, fuel, and legal cost. This event is, as described above, less of a professional protest with the usual sad players, but rather is a truly organic grassroots event that is gathering momentum largely from the widespread population. And then in bold, read, expect very large crowds. Am I correct? That is correct. And then the next bullet uh, went on to quote uh, from a journalist, uh, to the fact that if we go to the last two sentences, when it finally meets a successful protest to air the grievance, there may be larger crowds and longer disruptions than was ever planned for, right? Correct, but I, but I also believe there's, there's pieces in here as well as in other intelligence reports that, that are missing that are very germane to the discussion we're having today. Mm -hmm. um, Large numbers, yes, we did, we did see large numbers. Um, what there isn't included in any of the intelligence that we've received is the community impact that actually occurred. There's nothing around um, the information that identifies the activities of the protesters when they actually arrive in the city. There's nothing that indicates that the protesters are going to use the citizens of our community as the leverage point to have their voices heard. The, in Ottawa, we, we manage multiple protests on a yearly basis. Uh, we've, we've managed protests similar to this on previous times. We've never experienced 
and had no intelligence to indicate that it was actually going to be the leverage of the community and the activities of the protesters to um, to use our community members through their activities as the leverage point to be heard. Right. Uh, you're talking about uh, the reality that uh, dawned on everyone once the convoy arrived as compared to what was known uh, the day before. Well, that's correct. Well, and, and what I would say is what was known the day before was that a, a large number and the day before, so if this is the 28th, the 27th, is we were starting to receive numbers on what the size and scope would be. Right. Um, and that the overall activity of the group moving across was extremely lawful and extremely law-abiding. Right. But you agree with me that this is uh, an assessment and this is a summation part where the writer was trying to draw some conclusions, right? That's correct. It's not, uh, the writer is not here just reporting uh, various pieces of information. This is uh, the conclusion, at least from this writer, um, having gathered all of these disparate uh, sources uh, of information, right? Correct. And, and I would say the conclusion here is that large numbers could attend the city and, and we, we accepted that. Right. Uh, that there could be um, traffic disruptions, absolutely, and that it could be uh, emotions associated to it, but not anything that would relate to the activity that we ultimately saw on our streets. Right. Now, if we go to the next page, uh, and we look at the, the third bullet, so um, the author is here saying that in six years of working, large demonstration events from the intelligence point of view, the writer has never seen such widespread community action, which means three things for planners. Now, the third thing is redacted, but uh, we can look at the first two. The event is likely going to be bigger in crowd size than any demo in recent history, possibly on par with Canada Day events, but more disruptive. Second, there is significant popular support for this event on a scale not seen in recent years. This means the protest groups have access to larger protester pools than they have ever had access to, which means there will be likely widespread disorganization and confusion. Now, so, so uh, the author seems to be warning here of something quite unprecedented, at least compared to recent experience. Do you agree? Yes, I, I would absolutely agree with that. So it may not contain as much detail about, you know, some of the, um, the events that the residents subsequently experienced, but it's providing a warning here as to something quite significant, not seen before. Well, I, I, would, I would agree with that. And I, I would say that um, all of the intelligence and intelligence gathering that we'd had prior to that indicated a very similar fact. Um, this group had only come on the intelligence radar in late summer uh, of 2021 and never actually materialized. They, as they moved across the country, they seemed to build support, but they seemed to build grassroots support. And all of the activities that we had seen uh, them engage in prior to that had been very law lawful have been very pro-social. The, the, the amount of people that were supporting them, from my perspective, actually gave it more credibility that it was a grassroots uh, initiative, not that we, that we were going to see the violence that we saw on our streets. Right. And there's nothing here to suggest anything uh, other than a lawful protest. But the author is pointing to the significant number and the likelihood of disorganization, or at least the if not likely, well, uh, there will be likely uh, widespread disorganization and confusion. Um, now, if we go on uh, to um, the paragraph underneath the third redacted point, the demographic of the convoy is very unusual. The protests globally are made up almost entirely of middle class, members of society, since the so-called silent majority is numerically much larger than the professional activists. As a result, Law enforcement is being met with numbers of people beyond the norm. So it's just reinforced the theme that we've been on, right? That's correct, but I, but I, don't, um, I don't know that the numbers of people um, who attended 
from a from a pedestrian or from a protest perspective um, were were unmanageable or were uh, had any sort of uh, cons we had any sort of consideration about the activities that they would be involved in numbers on their own are something that we have managed in the past at different scales this was large this was unprecedented everyone realized it was unprecedented but for us as a policing organization what pushed it over the top was the activities that the people protesting were engaged in and the harm that they did to our community a large protest that was lawful could have been managed would have been managed it was what was anticipated the activities engaged in were never clearly identified and, and from my perspective that is exactly what made this unprecedented to any other demonstration that we'd ever seen. Right. Now, uh, what Chief Slowly wanted was for you and Deputy Chief Ferguson to coordinate an approach with you, I mean, your, your unit, the intelligence unit, providing the best intelligence to the planning team so that an effective response could have been developed before the convoy arrived, right? That's, that's correct. And, uh, and he took some oversight uh, role uh, in the days leading up to the arrival of the convoy, right? That's correct. Uh, he, so that. an oversight role. He, he had a role as a chief of police. He was informed and briefed on the progression that was being made. So let's talk about those briefings. Um, your reporting up to um, the former chief. How often do those briefings occur? So we would have had discussions on this on a daily basis at our command team calls. And that's where I would be briefed by Superintendent Patterson and that information would be shared on our command team calls. As we came into the week of the 24th, which I believe is a Monday, um, and we started to increase those briefings and actually there was uh, in person, I don't know the specific time, but there was in person briefings by Superintendent Patterson in terms of what we were seeing and how we were moving ahead to the command team. Now, if Superintendent Patterson knew of the Handon report as early as January 13th, um, why was it that you weren't aware until the week of the 20th? So one of my responsibilities as the Deputy Chief is to make sure that the information is shared. Uh, and Superintendent Patterson and I had discussions around that. Um, he, we had discussions around Project Hendon. And, may, and one of my responsibilities was through him to ensure that the information we were receiving was gathered by intelligence, but also shared with our planning team. And he ensured me that that was happening. And then I then briefed me on the information that was occurring. He identified that uh, there was regular ongoing calls that picked up in, in uh, tempo and intensity as, as the convoy moved across and came closer to Ottawa. Um, and it wasn't until some point this during that week that he identified that Project Hendon actually had an output in a, in a formal report. It was unknown to me before that. And that's when uh, I requested that he started sharing it with me and he started to share it with me. Okay, um, now I want to ask you about uh, the plan, the initial plan that was re developed to respond to the Freedom Convoy events. Uh, that plan was also dated January 28th, right? Uh, so I would need to see the plan yes. you're referencing because there's, there's different plans. Right, uh, so um, can we call up the document um, OPP, sorry, OPS, Four zeros, four two two one. So can can we zoom in to look at the entire first page, the cover page, please? So uh, this document is titled Freedom Convoy, Canada Unity, January 29th, uh, 2022. So the title date is also 29th, but if we go down, we may need to enlarge it now to see the, the print. Um, here is noted that it's authored, oh, well, actually, actually the name uh, of the author is redacted. Um, let me put 
we have a, the identical document in an unredacted fashion, and I've spoken to counsel about this before. Um, let's call up uh, the identical document in an unredacted version, which is OPP 404262. Can we go down, please? So here we know that the author of this uh, is Sean, Sergeant Sean K and is dated January 28th, 2022. Am I correct? That is correct. So that's the same day of the threat assessment that we saw earlier. That is correct. Now, if we turn the next page, um, the authorizing authorities, uh, there are two here noted. Uh, the first one is Staff Sergeant Kevin Kennedy. And if we go down, uh, and Inspector Russ Lucas. Uh, and we heard from uh, Deputy Ferguson last week that these are members of the planning team. Am I correct? That is correct. Um, so uh, if we go to page seven, I believe, that's where uh, there was a risk uh, assessment section. Threat assessment. Um, are you familiar with uh, this part of the plan? Yes, I am. Can we scroll down a little? Am, am I able to read it before we scroll through? Yes, of course. Uh, can we go back up to the beginning of the section? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so we can, can scroll, we down, scroll down now? Yeah, I'm good to move on. Okay, next page. If we can, sorry. Can I just have you scroll up one there? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank now, you. Um, did you read it at around that time? Yes, I would have. I would have received um, the the threat assessment as I was provided, and I believe it was on the twenty eighth. The the copy of the operational plan that was being put forward. And what did you think of it at the time? Um, so I I received this prior to receiving the actual threat assessment that had been had been finalized, and what I what I did know is that um, there had been very good levels of intelligence sharing amongst the planning team. Uh, the planning team had been uh, directly- Excuse me, Matt, I'm are sorry. you- I, Sorry, no, the only thing I want to point out is we've lost uh, connection to the database. So it's difficult for me to see the screen from there. I gather some of my colleagues have also lost okay, connection. Okay, we have a- It's the internet that appears to be down, Commissioner. Um, I don't think it's the party database. We've all lost uh, internet connection, if, if that helps. So internet connection is gone for everyone, but not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's something to be read into that. Um, <laughs> I'll just take a moment and the, the technicians are, are dealing with it because uh, obviously those who don't have perfect sight may not be seeing the, the monitors. Can you tell me when it's back up? Thank you very much. Please. Interim Chief, um, if I could take you back to the um, initial plan of the 28th of January at page seven, where the threat assessment is found. I think you were in the process of going through uh, the assessment. Yes, that's correct. Uh, um, I, I'm gonna ask you to repeat if there was a question in there. I believe I had an answer, but I wanna make sure I'm answering the correct question. 
Well, that's a very good question. I actually don't remember what I asked, but uh, <laughs> let's start with, uh, so uh, are, have you reviewed, uh, are, are you, have you completed your review of this yes, section? Okay. So um, I'd like to know, uh, first of all, whether you agree with this assessment. So um, at, at the time, I think it's very important to identify how this assessment would have been created. We did create an overall threat assessment, which is extremely important, but this assessment would have also been influenced directly by uh, the connection that existed between our intelligence unit and the planning team. Um, so, and much of that information would have been gathered through the ongoing Hendon reports. So, the ongoing Hendon reports and the analysis of that and more formulated the overall threat assessment that would have helped to support this. But there was also on the ground regular dialogue about the incoming uh, information that was contained or not contained, as we've had discussions about, uh, in in to help formulate this threat assessment. If I understand you correctly, uh, your team, the intelligence unit, uh, was both gathering information based on the hand-in reports, but also trying to gather information from other sources to corroborate those uh, intelligence reports. Is that right? Well, that yes, and that's that was one of the big challenges that also made this unprecedented. It is that um, there was information, there was intelligence through Hendon, but there was information in an unprecedented and almost inundating way that was coming in, and as it was building through the week until this threat assessment was completed. Uh, our members worked constantly uh, with the members of the fellow members of the intelligence group, and by this time on the 28th, there was already a joint intelligence group that had been established that was embedded within the planning cell uh, to try and take the, the voluminous information that was coming in and assess it and then disseminate it to try and get a picture of what was going to occur uh, at this point within hours. And looking at uh, this threat assessment and in the context of the 28th of January, what you knew, what your team knew at the time, do you consider this an accurate reflection of the reality uh, to the best that anyone in your team can know? So I, um, at the time, I, w I wouldn't have known this because I hadn't had the opportunity to review and look through all the Hendon reports, but I, I think it is a very accurate assessment. I think there is one area that's missing that we, um, we didn't highlight enough because I don't believe we had enough information to substantiate the level of risk that it created and that's specifically around the fact that there may be some uh, members of of the convoy who would stay on for a longer period of time around the 28th 29th and 30th that we were planning for so in in retrospect having having identified all of this that should the the potential that that could occur should have been something that was included in so that's the one thing uh, in your view, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the one thing in your view that was perhaps missing from the assessment is the risk of a prolonged uh, occupation, if we can call it that. That's correct. Now, um, let me take you to uh, some of the other information that uh, you said might have been available uh, as well at that time. Um, so, now, uh, you, you talked about Hendon report. Maybe before we go to the other sources, let's talk a little bit more about Hendon. Um, you became aware of it during the week of the 20th, uh, but you also told us that you didn't read, you didn't go back and read all of the Hendon reports. Uh, I want to get a sense of what you did read um, and what's the, your best recollection as to which Hendon reports you did read at the time. Well, I would have, I would have, I received them and would have, um read them on an ongoing basis, um, as well as receiving all, like I said, we were inundated with other information. So mm -hmm. we were receiving lots of information at that point. And as I received it, I was trying to ensure with, within my role that we were funneling it to the right area so it could be properly assessed. So if I got information, and I regularly did, whether it be from concerned community members, counselors, 
uh, all sorts of different sources, I would ensure that that information was funneled through our joint intelligence group for assessment, uh, anal and analysis, and, and action. Which was the first Hendon report that you read? So the first Hendon report that I received and read was the 27th. And so I think you said that from then on, you read every um, Hendon report afterwards on an ongoing basis. Absolutely. Did you ask for the earlier Hendon reports? No, I didn't because uh, at that point I knew that they had been shared between the intelligence unit who had done the assessments necessary and the planning unit who needed to have that information in order to conduct their planning. Right. So um, since you did read uh, the 27th report, um, let's go to uh, the 27th report and see what uh, it says. Um, if I can find... So just, just for clarification, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I have since reviewed all of the Hendon reports. Okay, yeah. Um, but since we, we, we're interested in finding out uh, what was known to you at the time, let's start with the 27th. Um, I believe it is... Um, OPP four zeros one three three one. If we go to page four of this report, go down. Okay, so do you see the paragraph that says it is highly unlikely that heavy machinery would be transported in the convoy if there was no intent to use it, or if some individuals in the convoy did not anticipate that it would be needed. Such equipment could be used to facilitate or secure access to strategic operational positions in Ottawa. The presence of this equipment in the convoy may indicate that some convoy participants intend to reinforce positions for long-term occupation in Ottawa to block access to strategic locations, to damage property, to render roadways impassable, or to intimidate the public, government, and law enforcement. Um, so this is the part of the January 27th Hendon report that you read, right? That's correct. So do you agree that the presence of the heavy machinery supported what the report called positions for long-term occupation? So I, while I do agree that the report states that, I think the subsequent action is, is very important to put context to this. Um, we identified this. This was one of the early areas that I identified as a concern. So as a result of that, through discussion with Superintendent Patterson, uh, intelligence was uh, worked with the operational branch to actually start to look at this, look at the existence. Uh, by this point, this is on the 27th, people are, are coming across and there are uh, police resources, specifically in this case, I believe OPP, who are with the convoy participants. Um, the follow-up that we received from that was that um, the PLT, the police liaison team, who we've, we've heard about through, through these hearings as well, uh, engaged with them and there was uh, understanding that that heavy equipment would not be taken into the downtown core. There was also um, understanding through the we, information we received back that many of the pieces of equipment that we're seeing were fluid within the convoy. It appeared, and as we understood, as it came across Canada, the numbers fluctuated up and down on a, on a regular, daily, almost hourly basis. Some of the equipment that was seen in here was people that in different locations had joined in, I, I would imagine or speculate that it was so that they could identify that they were part of this and didn't continue with the convoy as it came across. As a result of this information, plans were put in place to make sure that we diverted heavy equipment like this from the downtown core. Um, but discussions were had with the people who had this and from my understanding, and it will be a, a question better posed to Inspector Lucas, but from my understanding, all of the equipment identified in here or any other 
trailer based equipment never made it into the red zone footprint. So although this is concerning, it's something that we identified, action followed up on and mitigated. Now, do you agree also that um, there was a serious intelligence gap uh, in terms of any exit plan for these protesters? So I do, if, if we can scroll down to that area. Yeah, let's go to page six. So I, um, I, I do understand, and, and I know this is in black and white, but there, there is bolding there around in priority intelligence gaps. So um, I, I, I believe this area um, highlights some of the areas where, where we were concentrating on and some of, the, um, some of the reasons for the assumptions that were made. Um, this is, by this date, this is um, third or fourth, I can't be for sure until we pull the other ones up, um, where the intelligence and information had clearly identified a three-day event. All of the discussion was around the 28th, the 29th, and the 30th. There had been, through the reports, uh, passing reference, regular, but passing reference to the notion that a small group of people, a group of people undetermined, um, could stay for longer periods of time. But predominantly, the intelligence identified it as a three-day event. And the top five areas in here are identified in red as priority taskings. Mm -hmm. um, the plans for departing Ottawa uh, was something that was a concern and was identified, but based on the fact that it was believed to be a small group was obviously not identified as a priority tasking. And as part of our planning, um, the plans, the egress plans for the demonstration to leave Ottawa, based on the fact that there was the concern about how they would get out of Ottawa, was built and, and developed into our plan. It just never materialized once, they, once the groups dug in and decided to stay in the city. Now, uh, there are obviously many hand in reports. This is just one of them. And uh, the information continued to evolve, as you pointed out earlier. Um, but uh, Superintendent Morris from the OPP did testify here last week um, as to the likelihood of a weekend event. And uh, he said that he did not recall, I, I quote, uh, he did not recall any information which could lead to the induction that this will only be a three-day event uh, based on his review of the Hendon reports. Do you share his view? So I have ultimate respect for Superintendent Morris. I think he's an, an incredible intelligence leader in this organization, in this country. Um, but when I read these reports, um, the, the specifics around the three-day event are very clear as it moves ahead. Uh, there is references that some small numbers would stay beyond that, but all of the information being gathered, uh, in, even in, ter in terms of the priorities for the intelligence gathering is specifically around that three-day period. Okay. Now, um, let me ask you um, along this line um, about the fact that many of these truckers were coming a long way uh, from the West, right? That's correct. And, uh, and you knew that. Uh, so, for example, um, you understood that a group of participants from the Western Convoy uh, would stay, well, uh, let me give you the, the reference. Uh, if I could take you to your summary uh, at page six, so this is WTS 6029. So if we go to the top of the page, the second line, as an example, PLT reported that the Western Freedom Convoy lost many vehicles when it's crossed the Manitoba-Ontario border. Interim Chief Bell stated that as the Freedom Convoy drew closer, OPS knew that it was projected to be large. He noted that by January 29th, OPS was expecting three to 4,000 vehicles to arrive in Ottawa. Is that correct? 
That is correct. Now, um, given that these convoy participants had driven across the country for more than a week, uh, wouldn't it make sense that they might want to stay for a little longer than a weekend in Ottawa? So I, I, I think that's a, um, an inference we would now make. Um, but I, I, I think it's important to identify that they did drive across the country. The numbers ebbed and flowed. As they moved across the country, there was police agencies engaged with them on an ongoing basis. Their behavior, as it's described within the uh, within the intelligence reports and, and reports we had back, was that they were extremely lawful, that they were engaged in, there was no antisocial behavior that they were engaged in. And that was the observations for a number of days. Beyond that, the, or, the organizers clearly stated on many occasions and through the, throughout the Hendon reports that their intention was to be lawful and peaceful once they came to our city. So regardless of the, whether the number would have, uh, whether the number that would have remained would have been smaller as we anticipated it could have been, it was the, again, I go by, it was the activities that occurred here that were the most problematic. We in the, in our police service, um, manage many, many protests a year. Some of them are prolonged, some of them are protracted. We've had examples of occupations of parks, of occupations of intersections that have gone on for a, a longer period of time. But those didn't engage in the unlawful activity that we saw here. That is what I believe uh, makes this circumstance different. The scope of people, the, the size of the area, that they overtook and the activity and the trauma they put our community through. There was nothing to identify that that would occur within the intelligence reports. So perhaps if I could clarify, um, let us assume that the intent was to uh, engage in an entirely lawful protest. Um, making that assumption, uh, wouldn't the sheer size, um, the number of trucks and the intention to stay for as long as it took um, until the mandates are lifted, create a risk that it will be a prolonged uh, issue for the residents in terms of traffic and, and other issues that came with such a loud crowd, a large crowd uh, in the downtown area for a long time. But I think you identify the key point there. If, if, if the protests are lawful, uh, and they're within a contained area that isn't impacting the community, we would go through a regular process in order to ensure that we are managing that area and that we're negotiating with the people for them to be able to leave the area. That, what you described though, was not what occurred in our city. There was a larger, a large geographical area overtaken, and there was extreme harm done to our community through the activities of this protest that determined it to be unlawful. So those are very two, for me, those are very two very different circumstances we're talking about. Right. Now, you would agree with me that uh, around that time, uh, both for the former chief slowly, who you report to, as well as, um, Inspector Bryden, who reported to you through uh, Superintendent uh, Patterson, raised concerns about the threat assessment. Uh, do, do, do you recall any communication with them uh, about the, the nature of the threat assessment that was produced? So I raised concerns about the threat assessment and we had, we had discussions about it. So because because my expectation was that it would have created more direct references to, um, to the Hendon reports and to the intelligence information we were bringing in. The threat assessment as it's completed is done on a standard template. There is, there is actually a checklist to, to follow through as you create a threat assessment. We were trying to become more mature and advanced in our collection and dissemination of intelligence information. What wasn't included on the checklist was direct references to actual intelligence information that existed. So I was looking to make sure that we had that included in that threat assessment, or at least references to the mechanisms that we were drawing that intelligence from. 
Now, it would appear that uh, the former chief um, was concerned uh, that the threat assessment reflect um, the, the actual uh, reality. And in the days leading up to the arrival of the convoy, if I could take you to, uh, to some of those documents, um, OPS, five zeros, sorry, four zeros, three zero seven three. So uh, if we go down the chain and, and to see the, how it originated, go to the very bottom, please. So somebody uh, sent, uh, sorry, uh, go up. So it appears that uh, the former, keep going. It appears that the former chief received information uh, sent to him about some potential threat, go up. And he passed that information on to you. So let's stop here. So somebody sent um, information to the former chief directly. Uh, somebody wrote, I lay awake tonight as I read Twitter posts from the extreme right vowing attacks on Riddle Hall this weekend. Some are calling for action akin to the happenings in Washington on Capitol Hill. I understand the right to peaceful protest, but I'm writing as a very concerned citizen as we're not hearing any reassurances from the city of policing uh, regarding the safety of residents surrounding these vulnerable and targeted spots. So we go up now. The former chief forwarded that I'm to you. Sorry, can, yep. can I finish reading the, just the, the content? I oh, wasn't at the bottom. Sure. Um, all right. If you can just scroll down a little more, please. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that good? Yes, sorry, okay. I'm sorry, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> sorry I, I didn't mean to, to no. cut off your reading. Uh, if we go up now, it appears that the former chief forwarded that email to you and to uh, Deputy Chief Ferguson. Um, and, uh, and he said, um, the email below from an Ottawa resident who's seeing online postings from what he calls extreme right-wing elements calling for violence in the event. Um, if we go further down. Sorry, if you can just. Oh, there's one. Okay. At the, right. I didn't hit number three yet. Oh, I will try and read more quickly. No, no, no. Take your time. Okay, thank you. So he was outlining the concerns from the yep. citizen. Yep. And That's then he true. went on to say, yet our briefing note, as of last night, says there is no intelligence to indicate that this demo straying will be violent. Please review all available information, intel, incidents, and ensure we have the most accurate threat assessment and the most appropriate operations plan for the event. Uh, and he sent that before uh, your briefing uh, scheduled at nine. So you agree with me that the former chief was taking an, an active interest uh, as you got closer to the event and he wanted to ensure that the threat assessment reflects the most accurate information the intelligence could provide, right? Can we scroll up on the, the date? I'm just looking yes. at the date on Yes, I the, believe this is 26th. 26th, 26th. No, um, so in answer to your question, absolutely. We were all uh, taking an active interest. And I think it's important to note here that the information received by the chief was, was funneled to our intelligence unit and our joint intelligence unit for assessment. Um, the Hendon reports on these days, on the 26th, would reflect uh, that there was no anticipated violence to occur. So we were continually briefing on, on the violence picture um, and making sure that all of this information was funneled in to our intelligence unit and then in, into our planning team. It makes specific reference to activities or actions that could occur at, at uh, Rideau Hall. Uh, we did look into that, that it raises a national security issue and I can tell you that there was national security representatives including CSIS uh, and the RCMP in our joint intelligence group. So again this was information that was taken in, assessed, evaluated, uh, as put towards our threat assessment and, and ultimately this didn't bore, bear out to be, to be accurate. There was no threats made against Rideau Hall. 
And the former chief was also concerned about the language and content in the threat assessment. If I could take you to the next document, OPS 403748. So you see that this is an email dated the 28th of January. Uh, it was directed to Deputy Chief Ferguson, but you were copied on it. Uh, the former chief said, Trish, thank you for sending this draft operational plan. I assume this is uh, the 28th plan that we've just seen. It is well developed considering how fast moving and fluid the situation has been. I provided you with feedback on this draft report at our 9.45 a.m. meeting in your office. Review and improve the language and content in the threat assessment explicit expansion of operational scope to include parallel demonstrations, risk beyond the Freedom Convoy, explicit adherence to uniform conduct policy for all participating members. Do you know if that was done? So I, I, I don't know directly because that this was directed to uh, Deputy Chief Ferguson, who would have put it back through her chain of command to her planning team and the planning the normal process would be the planning team and intelligence would look to identify the areas of gap that the chief felt existed. All right. Let me take you to uh, the note of uh, Acting Superintendent Bryden on the 28th. This is OPS 301455. Can we go down? Sorry, I uh, Oh, sorry, I didn't give you the page number. Page nine, please. So um, TA issues, is that the threat assessment issue? I would believe so. So the notes of uh, Inspector Bryden said, narrative around convoy, but need more info on activist. Um, if we go further down, you sorry, see if the I can, sorry if I can, I haven't. Yes, I'm sorry. I'll let you read it. Thank you. The bullet I'm interested in uh, is the one that starts with plan is to demobilize the convoy on Sunday but current threat assessment does not support that operational move. Current threat assessment says low or no threat. Um, do you know what that means? So if you can, uh, and I'm gonna apologize, but if you can let me know what date that these notes are. I believe it's 28th. Can we go up to check the date? Twenty eighth, Friday the twenty eighth. Um, so I, I think it would be if we can go back down to the the notation so I can see what I'm speaking to. It's a little farther down. So I'm I'm not I'm not sure that isn't a meeting that I'm involved in. So I'm not sure specifically what he would be speaking to specifically there. Um, and I would say that we would need to cross-reference with the Hendon reports and whether there was any uh, inf inf reinforcement around um, heightening our concern that the convoy could be longer than the three days. Right. Um, now, so I'm not, I'm not in that meeting. Yeah, no, uh, but it's fair enough. Um, but he seems to be referring to the threat assessment and uh, he has no notation here that uh, it says low or no threat. When we interviewed um, Inspector Bart Bryden, uh, he confirmed that uh, that was the view at the time that the threat was low to no uh, risk. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? 
So do do I agree with the assessment that, that it was made, low that risk they, that they made it on that day, on the twenty? At, so you agree I, that I, as of the twenty eighth of January that there is a low threat of violence? Then yes, I, I would I would agree there is a low threat of violence at that at that point as has been identified within the Hendon reports. All right. So you interpret uh, the low to no threat as specifically referring to the risk of violence. That's specifically uh, the. The threat index, I believe, the Hendon reports were giving on on that day, not to the risk of a prolonged occupation. No, I don't believe that they were speaking to uh, a prolonged occupation because, as as I indicated, based on based on our experience, which was limited, and and our assessment, there was um, a low risk of the convoy in large numbers staying beyond the weekend. I think that that's another area that's very, very important to highlight. Um, Superintendent Morris identified that this group grew um, and tried to mobilize over the fall and actually never, never did mobilize. Um, they galvanized for the, the ultimate um, convoy that occurred. In, nor in normal circumstances with intelligence, one of the things that you rely on uh, in your assessment of it is experience. This group had not existed before. Uh, nobody had any experience in terms of what they were going to do and how they were going to position themselves. And, and I'll give you an example of where experience is important to us. Um, we have a yearly demonstration at one of our embassies that um, has gone on for a number of years. We infrequently have high levels of intelligence around any activity in that area, yet we continually create uh, a large deployment footprint between ourselves and the RCMP because we have the experience that it had that violence has occurred there and there is the potential for violence occurring. The same could be said about um, the panda game homecoming. There is little intelligence that comes out, yet we create deployment plans around experience. Nobody had ever experienced this, this group coming into an area. Ottawa on the 28th of January was the first experience in that. So I do know that following this, there was, there has been extensive changes internally and, and people have seen a definitive change in our response based on our experience. But across the country, uh, police leaders identified that they now had an, um, a scope of what their experience could anticipate it to be with this group. Before they arrived on the 28th, we had no experience and all of the experience as they moved across was that they were lawful and that they indicated they were coming to lawfully, lawfully protest in Ottawa. That experience package changed for us on the 28th. Mm -hmm. And I suppose one of the challenges you faced at the time was the presence of conflicting information. Um, I, uh, we put uh, to uh, Deputy Ferguson last week uh, the information that we heard from the Hotel Association uh, that uh, people were booking stays of upward of 30 days. And I believe she mentioned there were some uh, information to the contrary. So let me take you to... Um, one email, one chain of email, OPS 301930. Um, first of all, do you know uh, of which I'm speaking? Uh, the Hotel Association uh, was in touch with uh, the City of Ottawa, and I believe that information was um, transferred to the OPS. Yes, it was. And um, so, on the 25th of January, there was information that uh, there are all these people who may be staying for, over than, for more than 30 days. And then on the 26th, um, we have this email from uh, now Steve Ball. Do you know who Steve Ball is? Yes, I do. He's um, one letter off of my name, but uh, he is the um, CEO or the executive director of the Ottawa Hotel Association. Right. So if we go down a little bit. So it appears that this is, uh, do you know who Matthew Gravel is? Yes, uh, Matthew Gravel is a member of the mayor's office staff. So this is an exchange of email between them 
um, about the information they had received earlier. And now if we scroll, scroll back up. Sorry, can I, read, can I read the bottom first? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I keep doing that. Uh, please take your time. Uh, where do you, how far do you want us to go down? Uh, if we could go to the bottom. I, 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 it, Certainly. It won't take me very long. No, not at all. Can we go down go to the down very bottom? bottom, please? Okay. You can scroll up. Thank you, you can scroll up. Okay. Good to move up. Thank you. So I just want to draw your attention to uh, this part uh, at 9.08 p.m. I'll get a sense of how long they're planning to be here, uh, to be here by how long they, uh, I guess it should be book rooms. So far, it's only for a few days. Um, so is that one example of uh, information not being entirely clear? So, so it, it, it's an... It's an extremely good example of that. And I can tell you, we did receive this information uh, from Mr. Ball through Mr. Gravel, I believe. It went into our emergency operations center where it was put into the, um, the intelligence group to follow up. Uh, as a result, a member of our police liaison team contacted Mr. Ball and what initially was identified as a large track of people who were going to be in the city for many, many days was narrowed down to being, no, it's, it's uh, a group, smaller group of people who have booked a three-day stay. So one of the, ch the challenging thing for us is this, this, um, this was information that helped contribute to our view that it was going to be a th largely a three-day protest. Right. Now, so um, everyone's trying to figure out to the best they can what's going to happen. And uh, this commission has heard from Ms. Carrier, for instance, uh, a week or so ago. Um, I referenced this when I uh, examined Deputy Chief Ferguson last week, so I'll put that to you again because uh, Ms. Carrier, who was a businesswoman, a layperson with no access to any police, police intelligence, uh, just based on her observation, uh, you know, she said, um, if I could find the transcript, she said, to me personally, it was clear that the 70 kilometer train of trucks that crossed the country was not coming in for a small protest in a day. And to me, that Sunday night was to prove that, you know, somebody somewhere has, uh, had underestimated or not listened to the anger, frustration that a large, at this point, you know, large number of people felt. They were coming to the city of Ottawa as the representatives of what they thought, and they were going to stay there. They were going to stay there until they were heard. So entirely apart from intelligence reports and so on, there's this common sense inference that some people draw, that people are not gonna drive all the way from the West with all of these you know, um, emotions that the intelligence reports also refer to, to only stay for, for, for weekend. So in terms of contingency planning, uh, what role did intelligence have to inform that in contingency planning? So I think, um... I think intelligence would have would have played an important role and to try and highlight the risks that that they knew at the time um, and, I, and I believe that that was done it, it would it became um, more possible as was identified that a small group of people could continue uh, beyond the uh, beyond the weekend but that mainly was being planned around a weekend protest all of, all of the activities that we took, in, including this one with the Hotel Association, led us to believe that that's what it was. The, the intelligence, as we read it, uh, talks about a lot large protests, but the numbers that are nece necessary for planning uh, didn't start to come in until 
uh, the day before and that please don't hear that as a fault of, of anyone it was just very difficult because of how fluid and dynamic the situation was uh, for for us to be able to gather through our partners real-time intelligence so uh, intelligence continually stayed on continually fed the planning team of what they knew at the time with the best information as you described it though it was it was um, it was a fluid week. It was a roller coaster that week in terms of information coming out and refining down. And ultimately, the the numbers, the size of it weren't weren't fully refined until the 29th and the 30th when it was already upon us. And I'll go back to it again because I don't I don't think it can be understated. The real impact of this protest was the community harm that was created. That was what the, the the problem and the consequence to our community was through the activities of these protesters. There wasn't any information that identified that. And that for me is what created the, the need, the emerging need for us to make sure that we had the action plans in place as we saw that emerge. Our community were dramatically exposed to violent activity over that period of time. Now, this may be open to debate, what, but one may argue that um, the combination of the large number of people in trucks with the expression of an intent to stay uh, for some time until the mandates are lifted logically lead to you know, this risk of social trauma if large number are going to stay here for a long time. Do you agree? So and I think that goes to exactly what I talked about, about experience. The other, the other piece you need to add in there is experience with the group that uh, you're gathering the intelligence on to actually assess it and then to see how they are engaging um, in activities. The experience we had until this point was they were, you were exactly right, they were people moving across the country uh, determined to be heard, but they were, they were peaceful and they indicated that their intention was to be peaceful when they got here. That isn't what materialized and that isn't what caused the consequence to our city. People protesting in an area lawfully is something we can manage and handle. People creating an occupation that traumatizes our community was something that no community had ever seen. Is was unprecedented and was the situation we're facing when we began to get the experience of these people. Now, uh, we expect that Superintendent Bernier, who is testifying tomorrow, may say that there was a bizarre disconnect between the intelligence and the planning. What's your perspective on that? So I, I'm, I, w I would need to know exactly when he's, what, at what point he's speaking of, because what I do know is as, as the planning team uh, was doing their assessments and as the planning team was uh, building their plans that the the intelligence and the planning team were very tightly connected. I've, I've seen and observed several emails over my preparation for this that indicate that at every point that one of the planners is looking to develop a plan, they're referencing intelligence. And that's, as a leader in this organization, is exactly what I would expect to happen. Okay, um, so um, let's go to his uh, interview summary so that we have more contacts. WTS, five zeros, six, sorry, uh, six, zeros. six zeros, 30, page four. So if we go down. Oh, sorry, uh, it was uh, earlier. If we go up again, the second paragraph. Oops. So page four, second paragraph. 
Superintendent Bernier also shared his concerns about the Freedom Convoy with his supervisor, Superintendent Drummond, on the 27th of January. He told Superintendent Drummond that there seemed to be a bizarre disconnect between the intelligence contained in the Project Handon reports and OPS's preparations. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, so those those issues were never highlighted to me. I'm, I don't know what would form um, Superintendent Bernier's opinion on this, but those issues were never raised. And I, I, I would hope at that point they they would have been raised if there if somebody felt that there was such a disconnect between them. But the question uh, I guess I put to you is not whether they were raised, but whether you saw a similar disconnect between the information contained in those reports and the way the OPS was preparing for the arrival of the convoy? No, no I didn't, because I think what, what you could uh, observe, and it'll be very important to flush out through our planning team, is that the information was fluid, that we continued to develop more, receive more information that became more refined as we moved ahead. That information was shared with planning. I believe that's why the planning process was as fluid as it was as well. This, this was uh, a circumstance that was changing by the day, by the hour, with information coming in and intelligence was bringing it in and assessing it and planning was trying to respond to it. And then it wasn't finalized until the convoy actually arrived in our city. Now, as you know, this commission is ultimately about learning from the past to find out what happened in order to improve what we can do in the future. So as the deputy chief responsible ultimately for the intelligence unit, um, what are your thoughts on what could, have done, what could have been done differently or better in order for the OPS or other police services to respond better to an event like this in the future? So first I'd like to start with thank you very much. I'm very happy that that's one of the areas the Commission's looking at um, because I think there are many lessons for us to all learn through this. Um, some of those lessons I can tell you we've already learned and put, in, put into practice. Um, in terms of intelligence, I know that one of the things that we've developed is better capacity and capability around open source information. Um, what was born out of this situation was a unit that's been created within our organization specifically dedicated at collecting open source information and sharing it into intelligence. I think uh, they're, they're the opportunity around intelligence is to ensure that um, intelligence, open source and police liaison team information is more um, readily shared so that it can be cross-referenced. We've, we've seen that develop within our, our organization. I also think, and one of the things we've, we've been able to do is we read the intelligence differently now. We've had multiple subsequent events in this city where we've used our experience to leverage our operational planning. One of those was Rolling Thunder. And when you look at the intelligence, there was the identification that it, it, it may not have been a, a large risk event for us, but we used our experience to apply towards that intelligence and created a deployment model that actually ultimately did, I believe, prevent a, a subsequent occupation to our streets. So I think from an intelligence perspective, uh, the coordination and cooperation and, and it has always been good between ourselves and our partners. I think this identified that we need to expand that uh, and that we need to broaden the sources of information that we're bringing in and properly leverage them in our operational planning with the experience we have. All right. Now, um, let's leave uh, intelligence for a minute, uh, but still, I, I want to ask you about planning. Um, uh, if I could take you to um, your interview summary, which is uh, WTS 6029. If we go to page four. Page four. 
Um, I'm looking for the part where you said that the OPS's approach to the protests at the time of the Freedom Convoy did not consider community impact. That paragraph right at the top. Okay, sorry. We there. Lost it. Interim Chief Bell saw it as OPS. That's right. Interim Chief Bell saw it as OPS's role to respect lawful protests. He noted that OPS was experiencing Deal, was experienced dealing with lawful protest na on national and international issues and ensuring public safety at these protests. He commented that OPS's approach to protest at the time of the Freedom Convoy did not, however, consider the community impact of demonstrations. If we go down a bit. Since the convoy, you not only consider public safety and charter rights and so on, but uh, also the impact on the community. That goes to part of what you just told us. Um, now, at the time, though, um, you sought a legal opinion um, on what uh, lawful authority uh, was open to the OPS to respond to the arrival of the convoy, right? That's correct. I, I requested that legal opinion uh, following a, um, one of our morning calls or command team meeting um, as, as one of the requests that was going to be we needed to fulfill in order to make sure we understood our legal grounds. Do you remember when you sought that opinion? I don't remember the specific date. Okay, let's see if your notes uh, help refresh your memory. OPS, triple zeros, 14525. So um, it says here January 27th, and you have a note, convoy plan will develop legal opinion on how we will be able to end the convoy. Does that help refresh your memory? Yes, it does. Okay, so on the 27th, yeah, you sought the legal opinion. Do you remember if you got an opinion back? Yes, I believe I received the legal opinion on the 28th. The next day. The next. Day. So uh, let's go can, to can that now. Can we scroll down on my notes just to make sure I'm not missing anything? That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so if we could go to the next document, OPS four zeros three six nine two. Is this the opinion you received? Yes, it is. Did you read it at the time? Yes, I did. Sorry. Yes, sorry. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and um, did you circulate this opinion to anyone else? Uh, yes, because it was requested at one of our morning calls. I would have. I would have shared it with the uh, entire command team, I believe. That but I don't have independent recollection that I did forward it on. Okay, but you believe you did? I, I believed I did. We, I collected it on behalf of the executive team, uh, so I would have shared it with the executive team. And just to be clear, the by executive team, you meant? So it would have been anyone, so anyone who was present. So it would have been with legal counsel who would have done this, um, Deputy Chief Ferguson, uh, CAO Dunker, Chief Slowly, the Chief's Executive Officer, Kevin Maloney, um, and, and others. I just don't have recollection of who I forwarded it to. Okay, so let's take a look at this opinion. Staying on page one, if we scroll down, the paragraph that starts with, while the convoy, we could go up, yeah, that's good. While the convoy has not yet reached the city of Ottawa, various considerations will need to be assessed and reassessed to determine the appropriate response, including the balancing of competing charter rights, impacts to public enjoyment and the right to mobility impacts to health and safety, impacts on obstructing emergency vehicles, and impacts to public safety generally. Um, so I, I want to ask you, in preparing for response, um, how did you and your executive team um, consider uh, these bullets, including the impacts to public enjoyment and the right to mobility uh, and the last point, impacts to public safety generally. 
So I, I think that would have been done by an ongoing assessment that was being conducted by, by the planning team and intelligence moving ahead. Um, those areas were specifically impacted, as I indicated, um, and we only realized that once, once the convoy arrived. The anticipation of the community trauma and violence to our community that was going to w w did occur wasn't anticipated because nobody saw nobody saw that coming. Nobody knew that though that was going to be the the tactic that the mob that got here was going to actually engage in. So that is something that we we look at. We look at public safety. We look at Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, and all of these index, but we had never taken the view of making sure um, that the community and the surrounding areas, we were as responsive to their needs. We take that into account more than ever now, and that's what you've seen as we've responded to Rolling Thunder, responded to Canada Day, to make sure that we interpret our intelligence with our experience, but also make sure that we identify potential hazards or concerns that could occur within the community and put that absolutely front and center in, in our planning. The reason I highlight that is the one thing that I hear consistently after the, uh, the removal of the occupation, and very rightfully, is that we didn't put enough emphasis as a police service on our community and the impact that it caused to them in the very early days that they felt that um, we didn't focus on the harm that was being done to them. While we have always had that in the planning, I think we need to be overt in it and say, community, these are your, this is your city. These are your streets. We will conduct ourselves in order to protect you within this community and protect you within those streets. So I think the emphasis that I'm playing is that we need to always have charter rights and freedoms in our mind. We always need to have community safety, but we need to make sure that we bring the community impact to the front of everything we do because it was the area that was most violated uh, during this event. Now, the opinion talked about the balancing of competing charter rights. Uh, and um, perhaps many of the residents felt that there was an imbalance. And one of the central questions that arose from the planning perspective is um, about the ability uh, of preventing the trucks from entering the downtown core in the first place. So I want to ask you, uh, what was your understanding of the lawful authority for the OPS to prevent the trucks from going downtown uh, and park there that first weekend? So um, I, I believe that we, we do have the, the ability and I think we've exercised it several times since then to prevent the uh, vehicles from going down. A, a truck isn't a protected, um, a protected entity under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. People are. Um, that is, that is something we had not exercised prior as, as an organization. When we had vehicle-borne demonstrations, protests, or events in what is the downtown core, we had always allowed them because our experience was they had come and they had left and we had managed them. Um, and that was a regular occurrence for us. So that happened many, many times, usually many, many times a year. So although the charter doesn't protect the vehicles, um, I do I do know that our experience had been that we would allow those type of vehicles. I think there's another side to it as well that's very important. Particularly as we became closer to the date, um, we saw the volume of vehicles that were going. They were coming to Ottawa. They were very clear about that. They were coming to Ottawa. So the ability for us to protect and preserve public safety uh, would mean that we would want them to go into a designated area so that we could better control it. Uh, we didn't, again, didn't anticipate the activities. We didn't anticipate the size or scope of number of people who stayed. Because we do have to remember most people did leave on Sunday night. Um, so the ability for us to manage the protest and demonstration in a, in a core, as opposed to people coming and have a blocked off downtown core and leaving their 
trucks on the 417 or trucks dispersed around many different areas. It was going to be more manageable for us in a, in a centralized area. Right. Now, we ask uh, the same question or a very similar question uh, of Mr. Slowly, the former chief, and I want to show you uh, his answer and uh, ask you if you agree with him. Can we go to the document WTS 6040? And if you could go to page 15, please. Second paragraph, Chief Slowly was advised that based on the known intelligence reports, OPS did not have the legal authority to deny the Freedom Convoy access to downtown Ottawa simply because some people disagreed with the views of some participants. He understood that OPS did have authority to close roads and restrict traffic if there were public safety concerns, but closures and restrictions had to, be com had to be commensurate to actual threats or reasonably predictable threats. Highway Traffic Act or bylaw violations alone would not be sufficient to justify restricting access to the city for all protesters. Do you share his view? So I, I'm, I think it's important. It's there's a lot packed in there, so I think it's important that Take we your time, go uh, through it to, to reflect upon it. So I would say I would I would absolutely agree. Based on the intelligence we had, we didn't have legal authority to deny the protesters from a protest. All of the activity had been lawful and peaceful, and there was no indication of anything contrary to that. Let me ask you this: uh, in a subsequent event, Rolling Thunder, and so on. Did you have different intelligence assessment to suggest a more violent event or a higher risk in other aspects? No, we had we I we had experience. We we had experience in exactly what had occurred. We had seen uh, and learned from what had occurred during the Freedom Convoy. And we had worked with our city partners and policing partners to identify different mechanisms to actually restrict access to, the, to an area. So, um, in other words, it's not the nature of the anticipated protest that changed the planning. It's the experience of having been through what Ottawa went through in January and February that cause a different planning approach. Absolutely, and I, and I think that that experience that I talk about is something that you saw across the country as people planned and responded to similar incidents. Um, Tor Toronto Police Service and the City of Toronto had a much more successful intervention in a protest uh, in subsequent weekends to what to what we had initially. and, and Chief Reimer has been clear in, in identifying it. Part of that was because of the experience that they saw uh, occur in Ottawa, that they identified different threats in different ways and, and built a plan around the experience that they've seen us, they saw us endure. Would you agree then that the only thing that's changed is the appreciation of the potential risk? No, I, 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 don't, I don't think that that's accurate. Um, I think what's changed is we have an understanding of what these groups are capable of when they come together. We have an understanding of what could occur um, as these groups um, coalesce around a cause in an area. And that's rolling thunder. I would... I would um, propose that had we not had the experience we had, we wouldn't have planned in the way we did. We wouldn't have had the public order deployment. We wouldn't have had the exclusionary zone. And in that case, uh, the Friday evening that it occurred, we would have had a truck that attempted to occupy an intersection that was followed quickly by other vehicles set up uh, and, and be successful for a period of time in, again, 
taking over an area of our city. That's the that's the appreciation that we have of what is possible when these groups come together. That's the experience that I'm talking about that we are now applying to all of the intelligence. So if I understand you correctly, you said what's different is the new understanding of what could occur, right? Those are your words? Yes, those are my words. How is that different from appreciation of the potential risk? Your words are probably just more eloquent than mine. Okay, we'll go with your words. Um, now, um, I do want to ask you this. Um, taking you back to the legal opinion, uh, which is OPS 403692. We go to page four, go down. That's right, the paragraph that starts with therefore. Therefore, while the case law indicates that those who wish to protest have a charter protected right in doing so, it is not without limits. These limits, as the courts have recognized, prevent threats of violence, acts of violence, and unlawful conduct. Moreover, these limits also prevent demonstrators from obstructing travel on roadways. It is worth noting, however, that there has been at least one decision where it was found that a blockade for a very brief period only constituted a minor inconvenience and was therefore permissible. So what this memo is saying here is that there are limits to the charter and uh, part of the consideration uh, apart from potential threats of violence uh, is uh, the prospect of the demonstrators obstructing travel on roadways. That was your understanding too, right? Yes, it was. And when you have a large crowd of protesters and their trucks being brought to the downtown core with no exit strategy, why is that not a suitable consideration for road closures uh, in order to achieve some of the bullet points we saw earlier in this memo. So, I, and I think this, this goes back to um, how, how we have and how, how we had addressed these types of protests in the past. We live in Ottawa. We're at, we're at the seat of parliament. Protesting is something that uh, lawful protesting is something that our community accepts and I believe our community appreciates and they have an expectation on us to be able to appropriately manage and facilitate those protests. Um, so for a, um, a large demonstration to come into the downtown core in and around the seat of parliament and protest for a number of days would not be abnormal in this city, even with the traffic disruptions that would, would occur. What was abnormal in this situation was the volume of vehicles that came and the area that they actually, um, the area that they actually occupied. What was particularly, and, I, and I've said it and I will say it again, what was particularly different in this event was uh, the interactions of the protesters between themselves and the community. We had never seen that before. That was unprecedented. Okay. Commissioner, I am about to uh, embark on a new area. I don't know uh, if this would be an appropriate time for a break. Okay. So. The Commission is reconvened. La Commission reprend. Good morning again. Good morning. So, um, we, before the break, we were talking about uh, intelligence and other aspects of pre-arrival uh, planning. I'd like to take you now to the events after the convoy has arrived. Um, and during our interview, uh, you explained to us that the events after the convoy arrived could be broken down into different phases. So uh, I'd like to take you to um, those different phases and perhaps you can uh, first explain to us uh, what those are. And it may be helpful if we uh, go to your uh, Interview summary first. For sure. So, could we call up to WTS 6029, please?
and this will be found at page nine. So Interim Chief, um, you told us that broadly speaking, the events after the convoy arrived could be broken down into three phases. The first, uh, roughly from January 28th, which was a Friday, to February 4th, another Friday. Um, now, you separated the weekends from the weekdays um, because you said the weekends are very different. First of all, why are the weekends so different from the weekdays? So what, what we found during the course of, of the occupation was uh, the week during the week time, it was the people that were here. We would see those numbers swell Friday night, usually Saturday during the day into Sunday and then disperse into Sunday and we would go into another week long. But the, the people that traveled to Ottawa, uh, not by truck, not in trucks, but people traveled that on foot attended the area during the weekends really seemed to swell and rise. And the week was more of a, a stagnant, um, stagnant is probably not the right word, uh, a, a period where it was the people that were dug in and sitting there and remaining. Mm -hmm. So phase one from January 28th to roughly February the 4th, I, I believe you call that a, a period of orientation or adaptation after the convoy's arrival. Tell us what you meant. So during the, during that period, several, several key things occur. So uh, on the 28th, the convoy arrives. Um, we are anticipating a three day event with the potential of a smaller group of people staying and there's massive numbers. So through the weekend and, and I wouldn't be the one to to best speak about it, but through the weekend, the event is managed. Um, Friday, Sunday night, so I believe that's the 30th, we then uh, anticipate most people leaving. Many people le left, but we still had a very large red zone that we identified it with lots of trucks, uh, with antisocial behaviors that are targeting our community. So we start to then move into the Monday uh, where we're seeing a, um, a, an entrenched group who are actively demonstrating, protesting, and um, targeting our community. During that phase, so on the, on the 30th, as we're looking at going into Monday, um, demobilization planning is as it's called is is uh being identified by deputy chief ferguson so there's direction that's being put out by deputy ferguson okay so uh always the potential of them uh some staying we have a very large footprint now what is our what are our potentials to actually remove people from this area if we need to go there so that's tasked out on the 30th so during that week, we're, we're starting to orient ourselves. So um, I wasn't present at it, but on the 1st of February, so 31st is Monday, 1st of February is Tuesday, uh, there's a meeting that occurs between Deputy Chief Ferguson, uh, Chief Slowly, and the um, large public order unit commander table to start looking at options uh, for um, a tactical resolution to this. So that group then is tasked out with coming up with uh, um, options that could be used. That public order team then brings back options to Chief Slowly, myself, um, Deputy Chief Ferguson, and, and, and other senior leaders to identify the three options that, that, ex that they had identified on the 4th of um, on the 4th of February. So that would be, the, I believe that's the Friday. From that optioning, uh, optioning solutions that have come out, there's three that are identified. Uh, the command team has the discussion with them as we, as we go through, uh, weigh all the benefits of each of them. And ultimately a, an approach is then identified on the 4th. So that takes us through the first week. So the orientation is figuring out what's going on within the environment, making sure, trying to get the resources that we require or assign the resources that we require to hold the red zone uh, in a safe manner, 
try and manage public safety issues in the way that we can with the, the limited capacity we have, as well as then start to develop planning or at least identify strategic concepts around how we're going to approach this moving ahead. Right. Now, I have more questions for you about this first phase, but before we get into that, I like to, uh, you to tell the Commissioner, first of all, what the other phases are. Uh, so the second phase, um, I believe it is from February the 7th, which is a Monday, to February the 11th. Um, is that a Friday? I believe it is. I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm, uh, um, this is a block of time to me, the days. I'm not sure of, of what that day is. Okay, but in any event, uh, from the 7th to the 11th, right? I, I believe the 7th, if we, for, the 4th is, so the 7th, 7th would be a Monday, Monday and, the, and the 11th would be the Friday. the Friday. Yes. So during that period is the time that we're looking at doing, um, it was the strategic concept that was developed and approved was to look at taking off bite size or chunk size pieces of the demonstration to decrease its footprint um, to ultimately resolve it keep taking bites out of it until it's actually fully resolved. That week was orientation around uh, developing uh, targeting lists, for lack of a better word, identifying uh, how it would be approached and developing uh, smaller operational plans to do operations to try and uh, limit the, or uh, shrink the footprint. So that's the period when uh, you call it uh, the period of ad hoc responses, right? That's correct. And then we move to the third phase, which starts on February the 14th, which is a Monday, uh, and carries on to uh, the end of that week, uh, the 18th. And uh, I think you described that as the week when uh, there was a focus on the development of a, of a long-term plan to end the, the protests or, dem or, or uh, or occupation, right? Yes, so because we've only counted weeks, I think I would move um, that that date of when the long-term planning started back a bit. I think it was the 11th or the 12th. Right. Well, the, these dates aren't exact, but it gives us a general sense of how events progress. So going back now to the first phase, um, now you, you've told us in our interview in the summer that uh, that was a time, uh, you described it as, I believe, um, let me look for the reference, you said uh, the OPS was exceptionally unprepared for, uh, and, you, and the team realized that after that first weekend. Um, do you still agree with that description that you gave before? Yeah, I, I, I believe we were unprepared for, for what transpires. Um, in the sense that you weren't prepared for what would eventually turn into an occupation. That's correct. Now, um, so I want to take you to some documents and see if we can explore further uh, what happened during that period. Um, Superintendent a Abrams from the OPP testified uh, last week that he had a conversation with you on, I believe, the 31st of January. That would be the Monday um, after the first weekend. Um, and uh, you told him that the OPS is now looking for a four-week sustainability plan. Do you recall that conversation? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, tell us more about uh, that conversation. So as we transitioned from the Sunday night of the 30th into the Monday morning of the 31st, the, the reality of what we were facing was much more clear. Um, although there continued to be dates uh, through intelligence that we'd received that identified there might be an actual date where the group would pick up and leave. Um, we identified that that may or may not come to fruition and we needed to start to engage in our planning. Uh, engage in the, in the planning to ultimately remove uh, the occupation. So uh, one of the things that we did at the very early outset in a command team meeting I think it was actually at our morning call or a specific briefing around the convoy. I can't remember which one it was, but we established for the purposes of planning what what would be a, um, a long window of what we sh what we could potentially be looking at 
um, for sustainability perspective. It, it's, an, it's an important premise for us in order to look, uh, look at the window that we're going to need to plan for. This is mainly not, not to identify when it's going to end, to identify what is the potential that we may, may need from a staffing perspective, from a resource perspective, so that we can actually look at planning how we manage our, our members and other resources coming in. So uh, although we had, we didn't know what the length of it would be at that time, uh, we identified on the long end a four week planning period for sustainability so that we know we would know we had the resources in place that we needed when we needed them. Mm -hmm. And you and uh, you and uh, Superintendent Abrams had ongoing discussions uh, as the events progressed about the different challenges facing the OPP and the OPS, correct? Yes, so uh, one of the things that we agreed to, because there were so many tasks at that time, there was a lot going on, that I would support Deputy Ferguson by being the conduit to the to the OPP to, to either ask questions at a strategic level or get input or questions from them. And that's the role that I played, and that's the context that I had my conversations with Superintendent Abrams. Around. Right. Now, if I could take you to Superintendent Abrams' summary uh, of the events around that time. Uh, perhaps you can uh, tell us if you agree with his description. Um, could we go to WTS 6013, please? Page five. So um, on February the 4th, Superintendent Abrams had what he characterized as a formal conversation with Deputy Chief Bell about OPS's lack of a plan and unified command structure. He explained that by unified command structure, he meant that OPS needed to be unified within itself because it was not at the time. He told Deputy Chief Bell what his OPP officers had relayed to him, that OPS was disorganized and poorly co coordinated he also told Deputy Chief Bell that OPS's maintenance of multiple command centers at the 245 Green Bank Road OPS office, where OPS's uh, MIC, that would be Major Incident Commander, mm -hmm. uh, Superintendent Patterson was based, the OPS headquarters on 474 Elgin Road and at the NCRCC in Orleans, where OPS's Incident Commander was based, were contributing to these problems. Deputy Chief Bell agreed that OPS needed to formalize operations and told Superintendent Abrams that OPS was trying to develop a plan and a unified command. In characterizing the conversation, Superintendent Abrams explained that it was an uncomfortable situation, but he felt compelled to raise his concerns and offer advice. Now, there's a lot here, so let's uh, unpack it. First of all, he mentioned that there are multiple command centers, and I believe there are at least three locations there. Um, is that what happened at the time, that there were multiple command centers within the OPS? So there was different areas where work was being uh, generated out of or coordinated, but the NCRCC, the National Capital Region Command Center, was the dedicated command center for this event. Uh, the ma Major Incident Commander, Superintendent Patterson, uh, did originate, uh, did originally work out of his office at 245, but I believe he regularly attended the NCRCC. I, I'm, I'm not sure that we'd have to verify that through uh, Inspector Lucas. There also was, um, was there another one there? Uh, Based the on 474, um, 474 was where the executive command was. So um, the NCRCC was our command center. That's where all operations were resourced out of. That's where our joint intelligence group was. That's where our incident commander was. There was meetings that occurred in different areas. There was different locations that did need to feed information into the NCRCC. But ultimately, the NCRCC was the area where operations were controlled from, from established from before uh, 
uh, the convoy arrived and only demobilized many days after it had been dismantled. If the NCRCC was where all the actions were, where the command uh, post was, uh, do you know why uh, Superintendent Patterson was operating initially, at least, uh, from a different location? I, I can't comment on that. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Abrams also pointed out uh, that there was a lack of a plan uh, and unified command structure. Do you agree with those concerns? So we had we would have had a command structure that um, that was based out of a unified command that was based out of the NCRCC, the OP, the Ontario Provincial Police, the uh, Ottawa Police Service, the RCMP, PPS, uh, Parliamentary Protective Services were all co-located in that area. So there was the unification of all of those resources there. From a strategic level command, no, I would I would absolutely agree with Superintendent Abrams' assessment that we needed a better, better, more integrated strategic level command. One of the learnings for me from this is, um, even though it was assigned to me, I I don't it, it wasn't necessarily more helpful for Superintendent Abrams from a strategic command within the operation perspective to come to me instead of managing directly through uh, Deputy Chief Ferguson. So those are those are some of the issues we identified and continue to rectify, particularly as we moved towards our integrated planning team and our unified command. Right. Did uh, Superintendent Abrams not also raised some issues with you about the the difficulty for the OPP officers to integrate in the sense that um, the OPS, uh, in his view, had failed to provide deployment instructions to his officers? So Superintendent Abrams identified um, several different issues that were relayed to the incident command. And I know one of the, one of the issues in the early days was uh, the tasking of a number of Ontario Provincial Police Officers who had actually the lack of tasking of a number of Ontario Provincial Police Officers who had attended to assist. That was relayed to Deputy Chief Ferguson and it is my understanding, it would have been my expectation, that she would have moved that uh, down to the incident commander, Inspector Lucas, who would have rectified it with his his partner at that time, the OPP incident commander, who he was sitting across the table from at the NCRCC. Is it your understanding that there were, in fact, OPP officers physically situated in Ottawa who were just sitting around and not being effectively deployed, notwithstanding the lack of resources on the part of the OPS? So I do understand that there was a cur an occurrence of that that was that did happen that was raised to me, and it is my understanding that it was immediately rectified and didn't occur again. And was there not also concerns that in terms of the planning, there were OPP plan planners uh, provided to assist the OPS, but uh, they couldn't really do their job because they were getting conflicting directions from the OPS. So I don't believe that was a concern that Superintendent Abrams raised to me. Okay. Um, could we go to page four of this document? The second paragraph, Superintendent Abrams also reported that OPS planners and the OPP planners assisting them were receiving contradictory directions. At OPS's request, OPP assigned two members, Inspector Yunin and Staff Sergeant Govan, uh, Govan uh, to help OPS develop plans. Chief Slowly had requested plans for three scenarios, went through the three scenarios. On February the 3rd, Superintendent Abrams was advised that OPS instructor uh, Michelle Moran had informed the OPS planners and the OPP planners assisting them to scrap the three scenario planning because Chief Slowly wanted a new different plan. And that Inspector Mor Moran's 
intervention had left the planners confused as to what they should be doing. Superintendent Abrams contacted Deputy Chief Bell, who informed him that Inspector, uh, I don't know if it's Marin or <laughs> Marin, lacked authority to issue planning directions and that the planners should be reporting to OPS Superintendent Jamie Dunlop, who was leading planning, even though Superintendent Patterson was serving as the OPS MIC. Um, does that help refresh your memory? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Uh, tell us uh, what was the, the nature of the problem or perceived problem. So, um, and this highlights where some of the challenges, I wasn't involved in um, any of the tasking that was going on around as, as uh, not the major incident commander. Um, so my, my understanding of what occurred here is, and I do recall Superintendent Abrams calling me and saying that um, Inspector Maria had come in and given a direction that was contrary to what, uh, to what we had expected to come out of this planning table. Um, that's why they then directed him to Superintendent Dunlop, who was assisting in that area and would be the person who would be able to provide direction as being involved directly in our morning briefings in terms of how we were moving ahead. I, I don't know what occurred to have Inspector Mara engage in that way uh, with that direction, but I did, I did highlight to uh, Superintendent Abrams that if there was any questions in that planning area or in that public order area, that it was Superintendent Dunlop who was best equipped to answer them, and he would be the only one that could give directions in that area. All right. Now, uh, let's move on then to the second phase, uh, as you've described it, uh, the phase of ad hoc uh, responses. Um, this would have begun on around the 5th, um, although you separated the weekends from the uh, from the weekdays, so uh, probably the 7th, right? Um, so I, I want to ask you about a, a number of events that occurred during this period uh, and uh, get your perspective on, uh, on whether they, they, they might be problem problematic uh, from, your, uh, from your point of view. Uh, first of all, um, on the 4th of February, um, I think this came from... Uh, our interview with you, but on the 4th of February, the OPS made an announcement about a search and contain plan. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And uh, my understanding is that uh, that plan contemplated uh, surging officers into neighborhoods affected by Freedom Convoy activity. That's correct. As well as hardening the downtown core protest site, including by closing into provincial bridges and highway off ramps and so on. Um, now you spoke to us uh, about this uh, at page four of your summary. Um, so I think what's on the screen is Abram's summary. Can we go to um, Interim Chief Bell's summary, please? So if we go to page 14, <coughs> on February 4th, during an 11.40 a.m. press conference, Chief slowly announced that police would close highway off-ramps and interprovincial bridges to prevent convoy participants from entering Ottawa. Now, first of all, um, I don't know how precise the wording uh, is, so I want to ask for your best recollection uh, of what was announced uh, during that press conference. So what was announced during that press conference was that um, the Ottawa Police Service would take into account all options, including consideration of closing of the off-ramps and of the interprovincial bridges. So there wasn't a definitive statement saying we are closing the bridges. 
it was it was a statement by Chief Slowly indicating we could, we can, and we will consider it if it's appropriate. Now, if we carry on, uh, Superintendent Abrams called Interim Chief Bell and informed him that OPS had not consulted OPP on February 5th during a 10 a.m. briefing meeting. Whoops, no, 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 uh, stay where we are. Uh, on February 5th, during a 10 a.m. briefing meeting that Interim Chief Bell attended, Chief slowly directed OPS officers attending the meeting to close off ramps and bridges. First of all, uh, is that accurate? Yes, it is. Chief slowly directed OPS officers attending the meeting to close off ramps and bridges. Interim Chief Bell stated that his understanding was that OPP, not OPS, was responsible for closing off ramps and that OPS lacked authority to close interprovincial bridges. Could you explain uh, the authority to do any of these things to us, please? So the ability to close off ramps um, is normally um, attributed to the OPP, the Ontario Provincial Police, because they are the police the jurisdiction responsible, or the police responsible for uh, the 400 series highways through Ottawa. So Ottawa police would not normally engage in, in exigent circumstances that could occur, but we would not normally engage in closing off ramps at the top of the ramp because it was an OPP responsibility. We do have the ability to close ramps on the street side, uh, but that creates traf traffic problems and, and, and issues. So um, we, we could close them, but not normally. Interprovincial bridges are, are a different circumstance. Interprovincial bridges are much more challenging to close, uh, particularly in a preventative way. In exigent circumstances, as things are occurring, they may be closed. And, and the first weekend, the second weekend, and even in the third weekend, you saw that happen when um, the threshold for us to, to do that was met by the operational commanders. But to preemptively close an interprovincial bridge would take the, um, would take the intervention of um, the, the um, I believe it's the Minister of Transportation, to be able to uh, um, allow us on a preventative measure to close those bridges. So if I understand the sequence, uh, the press conference happened on the 4th, right? That's correct. And then the directions to, 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 to do these things, to close off ramps and bridges and so on, came on the 5th, the day after. That's correct, but oh. they're, they're, so the, on the 5th, and I, and I think it's an important context to set, the 5th is a Saturday. The 5th is where we're starting to see large number of ingress uh, people into our community. Um, the, the, the intelligence and the information we have around convoys uh, is starting to come in again. So this is, I believe, and I believe that this is the chief uh, responding to the increased uh, threat that we f we feel we may be under as we move ahead. That's part of why you distinguish the weekends from the weekdays. They were very different periods of time from an operational perspective. Right. Now, um, with respect to this incident, the fourth and the fifth, uh, the proposed actions and so on, did you have any concern about the way things unfolded? So I did, um, on the 4th, no, I, I, I believe the statements that were made were, were very appropriate. We will consider everything as we move ahead. Uh, on, on the 5th, my only concern would be um, to, to, as the Chief of Police, to provide direction like that on an operational matter uh, as, um, as the Chief of Police. That's something that I, I believe should be considered contemplated uh, at a, an operational level, not a strategic level. Um, and that would have been my concern in that area. And why would it be a problem for a strategic level leader um, be directing operations? What is the, the concern underlying this this rule that the, the operational commander should be doing these things instead of the strategic commander? 
the incident command system has levels within it for very distinct reasons. And that's so that you can actually accomplish the operation that you want to with the most clarity, the most understanding, uh, and the, the most safely way possible. The strategic level needs to actually identify what is the approach that's going to be used, uh, what, is, what is the general outcomes that we are looking for. Um, the operational needs to then look at how, what are, what are the resources, how are we actually going to make that happen. The tactical level then needs to execute on those plans. When somebody engaged at a strategic level began, begins to give uh, tactical or operational level commands, it creates a lack of clarity in terms of everyone's role within the structure. That lack of clarity then creates questions around uh, what do I do? What is my responsibility within this? Do I have to escalate and ask a question up? So the, the, the necessity to have that role clarity through it, it I believe, is very important. Um, and you have to play your roles through it because when you don't, you create a lack, you create a lack of, of understanding which can impact the operations. Now, uh, to what extent is it clear or ambiguous what action constitutes a strategic direction or an operation, operational direction? Sorry, can you re-ask? So I'm just trying to, to understand as a layperson, having never worked it within a, an incident command, like what kind of directions would be considered a strategic direction and what direction might be considered an operational or tactical direction? So this is um, this is one of the the key areas that um, I I believe that we needed to look at when I became interim chief in terms of how we continue to progress around around this area. Um, in this case, a strategic level decision could be: um, I don't want the convoys in the downtown area. Go and work how we actually keep those trucks out of the downtown area. An operational level decision, in my perspective, is uh, close the ramp so so convoys don't come into the downtown area. But I, I think it's also important to note there is no rigorous system that identifies exactly where uh, where each of those thresholds land. And if there is a rigorous system, um, there is four different accepted systems within Canada that could be used in this area. So it's an area that, that I believe is something that um, probably hampered us somewhat in this with the lack of clarity. Um, no fault attributed to anyone, just there was not clear clarity across, across the services, uh, across ourselves in terms of what constituted each of, the, each of those decisions. So um, I, I believe that that clarity needs to be struck and needs to exist. And that's one of the things that in the early days of me taking over the operation as interim chief that, that I spent a considerable amount of time doing. So the people that I was working with, Deputy Chief Ferguson, Superintendent Bernier, had a really clear understanding of what I felt was a strategic role and what I felt was an operational level decision. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in this paragraph that we just uh, read, uh, it would appear from uh, what Superintendent Abrams said that the, the, that the OPP was not consulted uh, before the, the announcement <clears throat> was made on the 4th uh, because, he, um, because he heard it uh, from, from the news. Um, and since you explained that uh, the OPP would have been responsible for the, uh, the highway off-ramps and so on, would it have been important to consult the, the OPP before the announcement is made? So if, if the announcement was we will be closing ramps, I would say yes, it would be extremely important. If the announcement was we will consider that, I would say not as much and only because the OPP at this point is integrated within our NCRCC. Uh, our command center and those would be operational level decisions that would be made. There would be tactical responses developed within that area uh, to be able to respond to the issues. Mm -hmm. So this is the weekend of the, uh, of the 5th and the 6th. Um, and uh, if we go to the following weekend, um, and I could take you to your summary at page 20.
I suppose the OPS was anticipating another search for another weekend. Uh, and uh, so, so I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, well, I, what I what I think, what I know was occurring, not what I think, what I know was occurring here was um, there was intelligence and tracking of a convoy that existed, I believe, within Quebec that was being followed towards Ottawa. That's that is what that it would have been the early morning intelligence briefing in terms of what was to occur. This is this is a Saturday as well. This is the final, well, the second final Saturday. Um, so we are continuing to 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 build, monitor, maintain the area, but we are tracking a convoy at this point. So uh, in the middle of the first paragraph, during the briefing, Chief slowly directed that OPS cl close interprovincial bridges and highway off ramps into Ottawa until Monday, February the 14th. Chief slowly indicated that OPS needed to act because of the municipal and provincial state of emergency. So there appears to be um, a perceived need to close these off ramps uh, and bridges again, uh, and he's directing, uh, it appears from this paragraph. Is that what happened? That's correct, yes. Um, so if we go to the next paragraph, interim Chief Bell engaged in back and forth discussions with Chief Slowly about whether OPS had authority to close interprovincial bridges and highway off ramps, including at a 12, 17 p.m. meeting uh, that OPS General Counsel Christian Hanout attended. Now, first of all, wasn't this discussion, didn't you already have this discussion with the, with the former chief the weekend before about the authority? to do all this? No, I, I had not at the, the weekend. Ah, I see. Okay. So anyway, you have uh, these discussions uh, with him uh, on the 12th, I believe. Um, and then uh, in the middle of the second paragraph, Interim Chief Bell explained that while planning and operations would ordinarily have been Acting Deputy Chief Ferguson's responsibility, he was relieving Acting Deputy Chief Ferguson that day so that she could rest. Ultimately, Chief Slowly agreed that OPS lacked authority to close the bridges and off ramps and rescinded his direction. So first of all, this is the weekend that um, Deputy Chief Ferguson took two days off. We heard about that, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. So during his her absence, you stepped in um, to, um, to look after her responsibility. Uh, and that's why you were engaging in these uh, discussions, right? Yeah, because normally this is part of the planning. That's correct. This would have been under Deputy Chief Ferguson's purview. Right. Uh, the next paragraph, during these discussions, Interim Chief Bell informed Chief Slowly that Superintendent Bernier had developed a traffic mitigation plan to divert arriving convoys away from the downtown core instead of closing off ramps and bridges. So first of all, uh, we heard about directions to close of ramps and bridges. Did you have the same concern expressed earlier the weekend before about a strategic level leader providing operational level directions? Yes, I did. But in this case, we have a different um, incident commander or event commander who already developed a traffic mitigation plan, right? That is correct. So um, we start reading from the middle of the third paragraph. Chief Slowly told Interim Chief Bell that he needed more details on Superintendent Bernay's plan so he could decide whether to approve it. Now, um, do you have any concern about the former chief expressing the need to approve the event commander's plan? So it, 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 it is not typical um, in in incident command structures. The strategic level doesn't approve operational level um, plans. After some back and forth, OPS implemented the traffic mitigation, can we go up? No, oh, sorry, go down. Uh, traffic mitigation plan, which kept convoys from entering the downtown core. Interim Chief Bell's notes record that during the 20, 12, 17 p.m. meeting, Chief Slowly, Chief Slowly told him that Chief Slowly would assess the plan and if not satisfied, would take appropriate actions. Interim Chief Bell explained that Chief Slowly was asserting his authority to approve or reject the traffic mitigation plan that Superintendent Bernie was developing, as well as to hold Interim Chief Bell accountable 
if that plan did not meet the thresholds that Chief Slowly believed it needed to meet. What did you mean by that? Um, Holding you accountable. So I, I, I don't know, but he, he did he did indicate to me that I would be held accountable for the success of that plan. I, I, I don't know specifically what that would mean, but uh, those were the words used by Chief Slowly. Okay. Did that cause you concern? No, I think there's a, I, I, so I, I believe there's a level of accountability in every level within the organization. Um, I, I actually believe I, I would be accountable for the delivery of that. Um, and I was confident in the plan. So you were accountable because you are now stepping into the shoes of Deputy Chief Ferguson, who was the strategic commander, right? That's correct. And so when Superintendent Bernier was uh, implementing that traffic mitigation plan uh, as the commander, you were the one then providing strategic oversight. That's correct. And that's why you would have been accountable if anything went wrong. Well, we, we ultimately, um, the chief's accountable for everything. Right. That's that's part of that's part of the responsibilities of being a chief of police. Um, the the uh, delivery of this day and the diversion of this convoy would have, from a strategic level, come to me, and from an operational level, come to Superintendent Bernier, who who developed a very effective plan and had teams that executed those plans very well. They kept them out of our downtown core. So was that an example of you trying to protect the autonomy of the operational commander? Yes, I, I would believe yes, because um, I, I strongly believe in the autonomy of the operational commander. The, and, and I believe at the, at the end of the day, the strategic intent was clear here. Keep convoys out of the area. Uh, Superintendent Bernier and his team took that away and developed a very strong plan to manage that. Members of our organization and other organizations executed that plan very well that ultimately did uh, result in those convoys not attending. That That is how strategic, operational and tactical level decision makings are intended to work. Mm -hmm. Now I want to turn your attention to another aspect um, that uh, happened um, during the convoy events. If we could go to your summary at page 13. Uh, if we go down a little. I, I'm, yeah, I need to, that's right. Um, so the last paragraph, during the interview, Interim Chief Bell stated that there were different perspectives within the OPS on the role of PLT during the Freedom Convoy. And we've heard a little about this, this different perspectives within the OPS on the role that the PLT uh, should play. Uh, can you tell us more about um, your perspective and the other perspective on PLT? So I can tell you about my perspective. Tell us uh, both. Uh, I don't know that I know what the other perspective is, but from my perspective, uh, PLT is an, is an essentially important part in the development uh, of plans, the pre-engagement uh, with demonstrators, and then ultimately with the engagement of them as you move ahead. Uh, PLT, the police liaison team, does uh, an amazing job of trying to build rapport with demonstrators and protesters, uh, and it goes. We utilize it now beyond that, um, in order to be able to have clear lines of communication, but but even more so have a good set of understanding of expectations of the protesters and expectations of what the protesters um, are anticipating to do when they're in their area. So they're they're very effective in the pre-planning phase and in the early early development phase. They're also extremely effective in the demobilization portion because effective PLT utilization can actually result in 
um, th usually through small sets of concessions, uh, through finding common ground with demonstrators and protesters in order for them to be able to uh, successfully and peacefully negotiate an end to uh, a demonstration. This specific demonstration posed exceptionally challenging for our PLT members from the perspective that there was so many different people, so many different organizers, so many different groups. Those leaders, organizers and groups changed on a regular basis and many of them had very different agendas. There probably could not have been a more complex and challenging environment for our PLT members to work in. And I can tell you, they came into work every single day with the absolute best intention to get this resolved peacefully. Now, the reason I asked you for your perspective and the other perspective is because um, when uh, you spoke to us um, in, in August, I believe, uh, and as captured in this paragraph, you explained that there, there were different perspectives within the OPS. So um, you've just explained to us the, the perspective that you adopt, as well as uh, Chief Ferguson, Deputy Chief Ferguson. Um, but as this paragraph explains in the middle, uh, it says, in contrast, Chief Slowly and Superintendent Patterson wanted to obtain quick wins. Unless PLT could convince the protesters to leave, they saw no room to negotiate and preferred utilizing enforcement. Uh, Interim Chief Bell explained that because of these different perspectives, there was often no agreement on how much negotiation should occur before OPS launched an enforcement operation. Now, does that paragraph, does this paragraph accurately describe the tension within the OPS? Yes. In relation to the utilization of PLT. That's right, that's right. Yes. Now, do you recall that on February the 6th, on around the 6th of February, uh, that uh, you had a conversation with Superintendent Abrams from the OPP, and he said that the OPS needed to give more PLT autonomy uh, to the PLT team, uh, and that the OPS command was not doing that. Do you remember having that discussion with him? I do recall on that occasion having discussions with Superintendent Abram about Abram. Can you tell us more? Uh, so I, I think you've summarized it very well. Uh, the Ontario Provincial Police has a an, a, an extremely well-developed, uh, well-used, well-balanced police liaison team. Um, we model our program around them. Um, and they, in in a much earlier way, in, in a much more active way would have liked, I believe, would have liked to see engagement of PLT throughout this. And I think what you're seeing there is some of uh, superintendents, Superintendent Abrams' concern over what he perceived to be a lack of utilization of our PLT resources. Right. Okay, so uh, we're still within the second Donc, phase, the second phase of de la ad hoc with page, responses. De cette uh, réaction de réponse, from different nous avons entendu uh, différents témoins parler d'une rencontre le 9 février uh, after the arrival of après l'arrivée du groupe de planification Ottawa. intégré à uh, Ottawa. Party le chef party et équipe, son équipe with, uh, ont rencontré l'équipe de commandement de l'SPO. I want to ask de, you about the du meeting SPO. on the 9th. Donc, sur cette but before le 9 the février, integrated planning group met with uh, your team, de planification uh, you were involved équipe, vous étiez déjà uh, in a morning meeting with the chief and deputy chief Ferguson, right? That's correct. And um, I want to take you to page, se page 17 of your summary uh, about your recollection of that meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, the first paragraph, after the briefing ended, Chief Slowly met with Interim Chief Bell, Acting Deputy Chief Ferguson, and OPS Chief Administrative Officer Blair Dunker at 9.15 a.m. During this meeting, Chief Slowly told the attendees that the integrated planning team had come to judge OPS to take control or command of the situation and that they would base decisions on whether to send RCMP 
and OPP resources on whether the OPS had plans, Chief slowly expressed the view that OPP and RCMP were not there to help and were taking directions from their political masters. Um, does that accord with your recollection of what happened that morning? Yes, it does. Um, what do you <coughs> understand? <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. What do you understand to be the reason that the former chief expressed those concerns? So I, I, I don't know what the reasons would be. I, um, I don't know what uh, Chief Slowly's experience would have been with the OPP, the RCMP. It, it was surprising to me because up to that point, all during through this and continuing on, I've had the ability to work with both the Ontario Provincial Police and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and they have been exceptional partners, and um, they, they were exceptional partners to us through this. Now, in terms of the, the timing, so this is February the 9th, and we've heard um, that a day or two days earlier uh, in the Ottawa City Council, there was a motion. Um, I can't remember who was the council who brought forward the, the motion, but effectively to, to ask uh, the RCMP to take over. Uh, are you aware of uh, a motion? So, um, there, through this, there was many motions. I think you're specifically speaking about a motion on February 7th that was forwarded by Councillor McKenney uh, in relation to asking the RCMP to engage in uh, takeover policing of the parliamentary precinct. So, I, I am aware of that motion. Now, you were there that morning when uh, the former chief expressed these um, comments. Uh, did you understand his comments? Do you have anything uh, to connect with the events uh, before, such as the motion in the, in the council? So again, as I indicated, I don't know what, what motivated these comments by Chief Slowly. What I do know is that in relation to that motion, um, we had identified that it, it actually wasn't grounded in law. The Ottawa Police Service is the police jurisdiction in, in, um, in the city of Ottawa. So in all of the city of Ottawa, including the parliamentary precinct. So we had provided um, a letter to the city to indicate that. Um, and uh, so it wasn't grounded in law, that motion. I don't know whether it contributed to these comments. Um, that's a question better suited for Chief Slowly. But I do know that the motion as it was put forward wasn't grounded in law. Now, you mentioned that you did not share the same concerns as expressed by the former chief. Um, and uh, in the next paragraph, you explain why. Um, now, I, um, I, I don't want to take too much time reading through your summary, so I'm going to take you now to uh, the afternoon meeting with the integrated planning group. Um, and if we could go to um, a different document, OPS <coughs> three zeros, one, four, four, five, four, uh, I understand these to be uh, minutes taken by uh, the scribe at, at, at that meeting. If we could go to page 131, please. So can, can, I, um, can I just ask for a point of reference on where, where these notes are from and who's taking them? I believe these are... Uh, Scribes taking notes for uh, the, the former chief, right? I, I, yeah. I can assist my friend. Those are not scribe notes. Those okay. are notes of uh, Christian you know, uh, oh. who was general counsel. So, so are, these are notes taken by uh, Ms. Honnold, the general yes. counsel for it. Yes. yes, so they are not scribe Thank notes. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Council's notes. Council's notes. So, um, let me try to look for the reference. Can we go down the page? Mr. Ellis, is it possible to reference the date that we're speaking of from the notes? Yes. Um, so I, I, I'm believe not sure you said, I believe you said it was the 8th. Moments.
Okay, so uh, so I need 131, not 130, please. Keep going down. Oh, was it going? Sorry, can we go up again? That's right. Okay, so do you see the comment? Chief, last night was amateur hour, hard for us to make our logistics there. We need to look professional. Our job is here. Our logistics are here. They will be embedded in our plan, and we're not embedded in their plan. Do you remember that being said? Can I, can I ask you to move up so I can refresh my memory more yeah, fully? Yeah, so on the uh, I, I think you're right. We need to know a bit of, about the context. So can we go up to find the time that may help determine? Okay, sorry. Yeah, down a bit. Sorry, can I just can I just read that portion? Can you back up a little, please? Thank you. So it appears uh, that this is a meeting that started at around noon. Okay. Right, and then if we go down a bit, you see the comment from uh, Trish Ferguson. I want us to limit politics. We've mm -hmm. heard from her that those were discussions at the meeting itself. I recall this meeting now. The chief said last week we didn't have an incident command. Everyone was running around with confusion. Now we know our roles as of noon. And we go down. Some of us did our jobs last week in what our teams needed. We need to stay focused and stick to the plan. Trish, <laughs> they're here to help. Not sure why. We're forcing them to arrive here. I believe that was a reference to yes. um, their attending at the headquarter location? That's correct. So getting back to the, the question I wanted to ask you, um, what did you understand the, the former chief to mean when he said, our job is here, our logistics are here, they will be embedded in our plan, and we are not embedded in their plan. What's our plan and what's their plan? What I understood him to mean is that we would maintain command and control of the situation and that any plans that would be developed would be developed um, by us or with us uh, at the head of the table. And did you understand why that was important to the former chief? No, I did not. Did you share that concern that uh, the team, the integrated planning group, should be embedded in the OPS plan rather than the other way around? No, I, I wouldn't share that concern. Okay. Um, now, if I go back to your summary, so switch back to the summary, please. WTS 6029. <coughs> Uh, we go to page 17. You see the paragraph at the very bottom. Uh, the very last line. You describe this meeting as contentious and heated. I, the very last I, line. I believe you're talking about a different meeting. The the meeting we were just last talking about was on the in the morning. Um, this is a different meeting, I believe. No, sorry, I, I thought there was a, a meeting within so we the had OPS a pre, team. I'm sorry. There sorry, I'll let you there explain. Was, there was a pre meeting yeah. before we went down and met with the integrated planning team. Right. The notes that you had just taken me to 
uh, were notes that ref referenced that meeting that Deputy Chief Ferguson, myself, I don't recall who else was there from the notes, had with uh, Chief Slowly prior to all of us attending the integrated planning meeting, uh, integrated planning team meeting. So before the meeting with the integrated planning group, there was that discussion to ensure that the plan was to meet with them and ensure that they will be embedded in the OPS plan. That was the comments. And, and then uh, uh, the OPS command team met with the integrated uh, planning group. And now here in this paragraph that we read, you're describing that meeting with the integrated planning group as contentious and heated, right? That's correct. Now, I understand that we also put um, to um, chief party of the OPP who was present uh, during this 12, 10 p.m. meeting um, about the discussions that, that, that was had during this meeting, including asking, the OPS asking uh, the integrated planning group whether they were willing to be embedded uh, into the OPS plan. And he responded, yes, they, they were willing to do that. Um, but tell us why uh, you observed this meeting to be contentious and heated. Uh well, uh, Chief Slowly, as as this meeting went on, um, expressed reservations about the reasons for which the OPP were present. Um, he identified that he had concerns with them that on a, about a couple of things. One of them was about the recording of numbers uh, of OPP members that had been provided to us, um, and another one was whether they were here. Uh, to help or to, to assess and potentially overtake us was was my impression. It was um, it was a contentious meeting that um, did not I don't believe formed a, a good start first meeting in in what I believe needed to be a very strong partnership. I see. Now after this meeting with the integrated planning group, there was a kind of debrief within the OPS command team, right? Do you remember that? If, if you can bring a set of notes up, I, I believe. Okay, I'll, be I'll try. So uh, this time we go to OPS three zeros one four four five four. So this is again uh, notes taken by Miss Hunold, the OPS general counsel. And uh, I want to take you to. Let me find the right page. Let's try 139. Do you see references to OPS debrief from meeting with OPP RCMP? At 1840? Yes. Yes, I do. And there's a comment attributed to the chief, as far as I consider, keep going. Nothing has changed until I hear something different coming from RCMP slash OPP. There's a portion redacted, but if we keep going, Chief said, no, they aren't part of the command. Just a pie in the sky idea by him. Nothing concrete promises was made. So I wanted to ask you about just what was discussed at this debrief, because we know that during the meeting, there was a request that the integrated team be embedded uh, under the OPS structure, and they agreed. But after the meeting was over, at this debrief, the chief said, uh, as far as he's concerned, keep going. Nothing has changed. Do what? we have, do we have um, can, can we scroll up, please? Because I just want to. Yep, let's scroll up. Um, so I am i don't believe that I'm at this meeting. Sorry? I don't believe that I'm at this meeting. You're not at the debrief? I, I don't, I don't believe so. I don't, I don't in, I don't recall it and I don't believe that it's in my notes. So I don't, I don't believe that I did attend this meeting. This is on, on the 9th. That's right. Yes. So I don't, I don't believe that I was at the, the debrief meeting. Okay. Is there any notations that indicates I was there? I'm sorry? Is there any notations that indicates I was there? Well, this is uh, just, what we have. Uh, it, it doesn't 
specify who was present at this debrief. Uh, I, I, I suppose it was an assumption on my part my that because you were, you were there during the meeting that you were part of the debrief. My apologies, I don't believe I was there. That's fine, that's fine. Now, uh, I understand also that Interim Chief uh, Bell, you were involved uh, as part of the, um, the negotiation, well, not as uh, a negotiator, but you facilitated uh, the negotiation between the city and the protesters. So I was involved in facilitating contact so That's that right. the negotiations could occur. So um, I want to take you back to the beginning of those events uh, and ask you when, what date were you first involved in that process? So I, I believe that I first became involved in the process um, on February the 8th, I believe. And I'm, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not 100 percent. I don't know if you have a document that references the specific date. I, I do under I do recall the sequence of events, um, but I'm not sure of the specific date. I believe it's the eighth. Okay. But tell us uh, your best recollection as to what happened when. So I was contacted by Superintendent Patterson, um, who identified that he was looking for a contact between. Um, the police liaison team and someone in the city to have a discussion with uh, a group of protesters. Um, so I, I questioned him as to what what level are you looking for? Is it uh, are you looking for somebody to help arrange getting porta bodies, or are you looking for somebody at a at a higher level? I would like, so we got some clarification around exactly. Uh, what the request was, and it was determined that it was somebody in a senior level position, um, either from the city or from politically from the city or from the city bureaucracy, i.e. the mayor or Steve Kanalakis, um, and that uh, they were asking me to make co um, bridge contact with them. I, I contacted uh, Mr. Kanalakis and arranged for members of our PLT to uh, attend and have a discussion with him. And then ultimately, I created that bridge and I believe they directly contacted after that. So uh, those were the initial events on around, well, uh, you asked if we could uh, refresh, help refresh your memory by taking you to your notes. So let's go to OPS four zeros, actually, sorry, um, three zeros, one, four, five, two, four. And I'm looking for February the 7th, but I'm not entirely sure what the page number is. Um, yeah. So could we call up that document, please? Yes, it's OPS <coughs> three zeros, one, four, five, two, five. So my understanding is that, um, can we scroll down to February 7th? It starts on page 25. Page 25? Um, I believe it's in the evening. Keep going. All right, maybe um, let's try another. Uh, let's try another way. Uh, there's another. Uh, I'll take you to a, an, an email. OPS four zeros eight four six four. Now, if we go down to the very bottom, so 
So this chain began uh, as a uh, as a request from Mark Pedersen to John Ferguson. First of all, who is John Ferguson? Uh, John Ferguson is uh, a staff sergeant within our organization, and during this period, he was assigned to be responsible and head up our police liaison team. So uh, it started uh, as a request from uh, Superintendent Pedersen to Staff Sergeant Jer uh, Ferguson, and then we can go up and follow the chain. Sorry, um, can, I, can I take an opportunity to read that? Thank you. Okay, Front. go up. So this is when you are added to the chain. Okay. So does this help refresh your memory as to the date? Yes, absolutely. February 7th. My apologies. I said the 8th. It is actually the 7th. Okay, and the events are essentially as you've um, relayed. Can we keep going up? Go down a bit, please. Sorry, can I see the rest of the rest of that? Uh, Go down. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now go back up. I think that's the top. Yep, so it does explain, it does. Uh, so um, so we came from Mark Pedersen, as you said, uh, on the 7th, and then uh, you facilitated uh, contact, and that happened on the 8th, right? So my contact with the city happened on the 8th. I, I'm, I don't recall what date the meeting actually occurred. Right. Um, so that was your first involvement, and then you had uh, more involvement uh, later, uh, was it not the case? Uh, a few days later. So you need to be more specific. I had him okay. in every day in this. So um, I understand that on the thirteenth of February, uh, if we could go to your notes now, it's OPS three zeros one four five two five. Let's go to page sixty four of your notes. Yes, page 64. So can you can you move up please just so I can see the date that we're discussing? Uh, I believe the date is February 13th. Okay. So okay, yeah, okay. February 13th. So um, let's go to 12 p.m. Mm -hmm. So it's, it appears that there was a briefing and in which you were told of a deal to move the trucks. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Um, if you can go down so that I can refresh my memory, I'll... Okay, if you can go down more, please. Go down, please. Okay, you can keep going. Keep going, please. Okay. Now, I, I want to ask you, so in the previous page, page 65, uh, there were some concerns noted around uh, the logistics of moving trucks and uh, that crowd uh, filling, of crowd filling the neighborhood roads and so on, right? So it wasn't crowd filling, it was um, concerns that if we displaced a truck from 
uh, Kent Street, say, and put it in down into onto Wellington that another truck would then occupy behind them on Kent Street. Those were some of the, the, con the early concerns that were identified. So what was your role uh, at this meeting? I was there listening. Okay. I, I was just, we were just being briefed as part of the executive command. Uh, this is on the 13th, so uh, I believe Deputy Chief Ferguson is again, uh, has responsibility of convoy operations. So I'm just one of the executive team who's uh, listening and receiving this information to identify what actions we need to take. Now, by this time, Deputy Chief uh, Ferguson would have been back, right? Yes, that's correct. And um, so how did you uh, become involved uh, in this? So I believe if we go up, it was it was an overall command level briefing. So if you can go up and I'll identify the people there. Yes, so a little higher, please. Yep, so um, Chief wasn't, he called the meeting this way, he's not identified. John Steinbeck's Christian, you know, uh, Kathy Burns and Vicki Nelson's are scribes. Steve Box, who's the uh, chief of staff for uh, Mr. Kanalakis and Mr. Kanalakis. So it's a command level briefing for us. Uh, I would have, I didn't identify um, Deputy Chief Ferguson, but I, I do believe she was present at this meeting as well. So uh, we understand that there, there will be evidence that uh, later that day, um, is it Inspector or Superintendent Drummond? Superintendent. Superintendent Drummond met with the city and protesters um, to work out some of the details uh, of the deal. Um, to what extent were you aware of those details? So uh, Superintendent Drummond was assigned to be the liaison back to the police because we would need to facilitate uh, the movement of those vehicles. Um, so he was assigned by well, I believe it was Deputy Chief Ferguson who assigned him to do that. So that was my understanding of his responsibility. So uh, that was the first time we saw on this date that you were involved in any discussions. Can you tell us what came of this and what was your role, if any, in the subsequent uh, events? So I didn't, um, I, I was continually briefed. I didn't have a specific role at, at this point. Um, we'd ensured that the chief had ensured that Deputy Chief Ferguson uh, was the single point of contact uh, for the convoy operations and I was responsible for things that included our enterprise project management change uh, projects. So I wouldn't have had any direct role in it um, other than being present and helping to support whatever was needed of me. Now, 